Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Welcome to Shabbat Service for Waymaker Messianic Jewish and Christian Center USA. We welcome everyone who is here with us today. And for those who will listen in later on the archives as well, we pray that this is a blessing to each and every one of you. Well, this is the recording for Saturday, August 17th, 2024 on the Gregorian calendar and in the Hebrew calendar year of 5784. It is the month of Av, the 13th day, and this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Well, I have some announcements for the upcoming week. Tomorrow night, we are going to be hosting services for two Ba'av. Now, we have just gotten through the status day in Jewish history, which was Tisha Ba'av. Now, this week, it's quite different. Um, actually, one of the happier days is Tuba'av. It's the day of love. It's also the day of breaking the axes. And we'll go over all of that um, in that recording. So I will be posting that recording on Sunday evening because uh, it is the 15th of Av that is Tuba'av. And on the Gregorian calendar, that will be August the 19th. So um, I will be posting that service. Also, in the upcoming week, we have in our Bible studies, we've got the main Bible study, the New American Standard Bible. We will be reading First Chronicles chapters 1 through 14. And from the Tanakh, which is an additional Bible study, we will be reading from Isaiah chapters 21 to 44. So we will be covering a big chunk of Isaiah there. Um, and then the Passion Translation, we will be covering Hebrews chapters 1 through 6, and that will also include the introduction to Hebrews. Tuesday evening, we meet live in real time on our free conference call.com channel. Uh, if anyone does not have that contact information and they would like to join us, you can just reach out to me and I will be glad to get that contact information to you. Every country that uh, has access, actually, that we've got 80 plus different countries besides the United States, but each one has their own individual number. Uh, the access code is the same for all, um, but so you would have to get that access, that access number for your country. And I have them all, so uh, I can certainly give that to you or the website. So if you would like to join us, uh, just reach out to me and I'll get you that information. I can tell you India and Pakistan have been on. Uh, they, they can access very easily and it's very clear. We've got, we've got a lot of the Middle East that actually can join as well. We've got uh, also the Asian countries, Africa, a number of African countries can join. Like I said, there's 80 plus different countries that can join for free. So if you would like to join us Tuesday night, we meet 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that is really all that I have for the announcements for this week. Okay, we're going to open with our opening prayer and get Shabbat service underway. Avina Malkano, our Father, our King, we just want to thank you for the ability to come together to be here on the Sabbath, which is the seventh day of the week, to rest in you as you have out, you have commanded us to do. This is the day that you sanctified as holy, and we are here to honor you. We ask it to, that your Holy Spirit come lead us, guide us, direct us, open the eyes of our heart and the ears of our heart that we may be receptive to what we're hearing and reading. Show us what it is that we need to grasp from this week's Shabbat service into our very spirit, incorporating it, and in our walk with you, Lord. Father God, we give you all of our praises and all honor and glory belong to you. And we pray this prayer in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, Amen and Amen. Chapter 20 of Exodus, beginning with verse 8, it states, Remember Yom Shabbat to keep it holy. You are to work six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Shabbat to Adonai, your God. In it you shall not do any work, not you, nor your son, your daughter, your male servants, your female servants, your cattle, 
nor the outsider that is within your gates. For in six days that and I made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Thus Adonai blessed Yom Shabbat and made it holy. Say with me now the Lord's greatest commandment, Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kivod Machuto Leolam Vayad. Hear, O Israel, Adonai is our God, Adonai is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. And you shall love Adonai your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These words which I am commanding you today are to be on your heart. You are to teach them diligently to your children and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on your hand. They are to be as frontlets between your eyes and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And the second greatest commandment of all is, and, and, and was stated by Yeshua, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The entire Torah and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The Amidah is a standing prayer, standing before God. We're going to say three of the blessings. The first blessing is the, the patriarchs. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, the great, mighty, and awesome God, God most high, who bestows loving kindness and creates all who remembers the kindnesses of the fathers and brings a redeemer to their descendants for the sake of his name. In love, King, helper, savior, and shield, blessed are you, Adonai, shield of Abraham. The second blessing is God's might. You are mighty forever, Lord, giving life to the dead. Great is your saving power. He sustains the living with steadfast love and with great compassion gives life to the dead. He upholds the fallen, heals the sick, sets the captives free, and keeps faith with those who sleep in the dust. Who is like you, Master of Might? And who can compare with you, O King, who brings death, restores life, and causes salvation to flourish? You are faithful to revive the dead. Blessed are you, Adonai, who gives life to the dead. And the third blessing is Kedusha, and that means holiness. You are holy, and your name is holy, and holy ones praise you every day. Blessed are you, Adonai, the holy God. Matavu, how lovely, how lovely are your tents, O Jacob, and your dwellings, O Israel. Because of your great loving kindness, I will bow down towards your holy temple in awe of you. Adonai, I love the house where you live, the place where your glory dwells. As for me, I will bow in worship. I will kneel before Adonai, my maker, as for me, my prayer to you, Adonai, is for a time of favor, O God, in your great love. Answer me with the truth of your salvation. In Etz Kaim, the tree of life declaration, we say this of the Torah. It is a tree of life to those who grasp it and happier those who cling to it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness and all its paths are shalom. Bring us back to you, Adonai, and we will return. Renew our days as of old. Bayam Hahu in that day. And it is said, Adonai will then be king over all the earth in that day. Adonai will be Achad, and his name, Achad. And Achad means one or a composite oneness. May God's great name be magnified and sanctified on men in the world that he created by his will. And may he establish his kingdom, cause salvation to sprout, and may he bring the Messiah closer, amen, in your lifetime and in your days and within the lifetime of the entire house of Israel speedily and soon and say amen may his great name be blessed forever and ever blessed and praised glorified and exalted extolled and honored uplifted and lauded be the name of the holy one blessed be he who is beyond all blessing and song praise and consolation spoken in the world and say amen may there be abundant peace from heaven and life upon us and upon all Israel and say amen May he who makes peace in his heights make peace upon us and upon all Israel and say Amen. And the blessing of Messiah, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Neten Lanu, Devar HaKayim, Mashiach Yeshua. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the Universe, who has given us the word of life, Messiah Yeshua. Say with me now Messiah's prayer. Our Father in heaven, sanctified be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And in the ancient days, the Kohen Gadol sounded the shofar to gather Benaiah Israel to worship. We are going to sound a shofar now. And in a, in a moment, I'm going to pause it for you to listen to praise and worship. If you have been following our ministry from the beginning, we have never posted music within our recordings because there were so many issues of people losing their platforms. And I know they've relented and people are now including music in their, in their YouTube posts uh, with disclaimers. Uh, we chose not to do that or to touch that. Um, what I usually do is I'll post the set of scriptures uh, and then a set of songs, which uh, are suggestions for part one of Shabbat service. And then I will post part one and part two of Shabbat service for both YouTube and Rumble that, uh, that are posted to. And I post to social media platforms as MeWe, Gab, USA dot, dot Life, Facebook, and my email group of people that, that get the services emailed to them. Um, so they get the full services. And then um, I post another series of songs, which are suggestions to part two of Shabbat service. Now you can listen to any or all, or if you have your own praise and worship that you prefer to listen to, that's fine. Just know that we, just because we don't include the music in this recording uh, doesn't mean that we do not honor praise and worship. Absolutely, we do praise and worship. In fact, praise and worship is one of the most important elements of any service. We were created to praise and worship our Creator, so it is highly important, and it can also be a ministry all in its own. Now, what I want to say is one of the big reasons why we post the way we do and and, and have these suggested songs um, and we're not including it in the recording that I'm doing right now. I could do that very easily, and I could actually make my posts very simple and and very few. Uh, but credit will not go to credit where credit is due because uh, people are not listening to that would not be listening to the the song on the actual artist's YouTube channel, and that's not fair. So we don't take away from our musicians and our praise and worship leaders and and such so that is the reason why it is posted on social media that way so you literally have to click on and you're redirected to that artist's youtube channel and you can you can actually help to support them that way by giving them a view so um that eventually translates to YouTube paying them. So we don't want to take away from our artists by any means. So uh, the other thing that I want to mention is many of them have hyperlinks. If you click on, it may take you to their web page or a, a place where you can purchase their music. If you can help them in that manner, please do. Um, also, many of them have um, outreach ministries. And so if you can also contribute to that, I'm sure they would appreciate that. But in any case, listening to their music on their YouTube channel is actually giving them views and, and supporting them. So we definitely want to support our praise and worship leaders and our musicians who bring us anointed music. Many of them, this is what, what they're called to do. This is their ministry that God has called them to. This is what many of them do for a living. So we certainly don't want to take away from them. So that's the reason why we post the way we do. So I am going to pause it now for you to listen to some praise and worship. Uh, when you're ready, uh, when, you've, when you've completed that, hit play. And we will be getting into the Torah portion 
and the half tour portion for part one. Okay, this week we have Parashat Vai Echanan, and it means, and I besought or, or asked for mercy. Uh, and the Torah portion is Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 23 to chapter 7, verse 11. Now remember, Moses is trying to prepare this second generation uh, who's going to be going into the promised land uh, with Joshua leading them on because he is not permitted to cross over because he did not follow God's instructions on uh, speaking to the rock. Instead, you know, the people got the better of him and he struck the rock instead. And uh, by that, um, Aaron and Moses were eliminated from being able to go into the promised land. So Moses is, is making sure that this, it, he's been very responsible with the people. It, it's been a big burden for one person, which is why there there were others that things were designated to, um, but uh, he he is making sure that they have heard everything that has occurred up till now, uh, and commandments. He's reviewing everything with this second generation, so that they can't say that they didn't hear, and and, and he's doing it in the presence of Joshua, who is next to carry his mantle. He is his successor. So we're going to start here with Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 23. Moses pleads to enter. And this is Moses speaking. I pleaded with Adonai at that time, saying, O Lord Adonai, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your strong hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do deeds and mighty acts like yours? Please let me cross over and see the good land across the Jordan, that good hill country and the Lebanon. But Adonai was angry with me because of you, so he would not listen to me enough. Adonai said to me, do not speak to me anymore about this matter. Go up to the top of Pisgah, look around to the west and the north and the south and the east and see with your eyes, for you will not cross over this Jordan. But commission Joshua and encourage and strengthen him, for he will cross over before this people, and he will enable them to inherit the land that you will see. So we stayed in the valley opposite Beth Peor. Chapter 4, B'nai Israel must listen and obey. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and ordinances that I am teaching you to do, so that you may live and go in and possess the land that Adonai, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You must not add to the word that I am commanding you or take away from it in order to keep the mitzvah of Adonai your God that I am commanding you. Now, this is very that's a very interesting verse there. You must not add or subtract from. Uh, that is also repeated in the book of Revelation. So we don't add to God's word and we don't take away. And unfortunately, in the world that we live in today and, and, and throughout history, People like to cherry pick and they like to omit things that they don't like to hear uh, because the, the Holy Spirit may be convicting them of something and they just don't like it because they would rather live in sin. So they will omit things. Um, the devil was very good at twisting the word of God um, and not giving the whole context. You know, and there's a lot of people that do that. They'll, they'll take a, a, a part of a verse, but they'll leave everything out before that or after that and twist the word of God, actually. There's a lot of people that do not rightly know how to divide the word of God. So that you have to be really careful at who you're listening to these days. And we were warned about that. We were absolutely warned about that. So your eyes have seen what Adonai did at Baal Peor, for Adonai your God has destroyed from among you everyone who followed Baal Peor. But you who held tight to Adonai your God are alive today, all of you. See, just as Adonai my God commanded me, I have taught you statutes and ordinances to do in the land that you are about to enter to possess. You must keep and do them. For it is your wisdom and understanding in the eyes of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to them? As Adonai, our God, is whenever we call on him. What great nation is there 
that has statutes and ordinances that are righteous, that all of this Torah that I am setting before you today, only be watchful and watch over your soul closely so you do not forget the things your eyes have seen and they slip from your heart all the days of your life. You are to make them known to your children and your children's children. The day that you stand before Adonai, your God, the day that you stood before Adonai, your God, in Horeb, Adonai said to me, gather the people to me, and I will make them hear my words so that they learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth, and so that they teach their children. Words from the fiery mountain. You came near and stood at the bottom of the mountain while the mountain was blazing with fire up to the heart of the heavens, darkness, cloud, and fog. Adonai spoke to you from the midst of the fire, the sound of words you heard, but a form you did not see, only a voice. He declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to do, the ten words, that's also known as the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them onto tablets of stone. Adonai commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and ordinances so that you might do them in the land you are crossing over to possess. So be very watchful over your souls, since you saw no form on, on the day that Adonai spoke to you in Horeb, out of the midst of the fire, so that you do not act corruptly and make for yourselves a graven image in the likeness of any figure, the form of a male or female, the form of any animal that is on the earth, the form of any winged bird that flies in the sky, the form of anything that creeps on the ground, the form of any fish that is in the water under the earth, and so that you do not lift up your eyes towards the heaven and see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the heavenly hosts, and are drawn away and bow down and worship them. And we know um, from Egypt all the way to Rome and, and, and all, they worship the sun. So they were pagan worshipers, and, and that's what they worship. They were worshiping the host of heaven as well, and, and other pagan gods. There's, many, there, there's other religions out there that um, continue to worship pagan gods. They are polytheistic religions, but this is not the God of heaven, the creator of all things. And that, that God is the God of Israel. So, um, furthermore, oh, I'm sorry. Adonai, your God, has allotted them to all the peoples under all the heavens, but you, Adonai, has taken and has brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be a people for his own inheritance as as you are this day he chose israel out of all the nations to be his chosen people and he would be their god and they would be his people and that is an unbreakable covenant that was made as well furthermore adonai was angry with me because of your words and he swore that i would not cross over the jordan or enter the good land that Adonai your God is giving you for an inheritance. For I must die in this land. I'm not crossing over the Jordan. But you will cross over and take possession of that good land. Watch yourself so that you do not forget the covenant of Adonai your God, which he cut with you, and make for yourselves graven images. So this, this is a real big thing, and it was repeated over and over again, from Adonai to Moses telling the people, um, and unfortunately, as, as you read through the Bible, you see this is one of the biggest things that Israel does to anger God. You know, and it's being done today as well throughout the world. Graven images are made and worshipped and statues. Or, they're not supposed to be putting statues. You're not supposed to be making images of anything in heaven on, you know, or you know, any heavenly images of anything. So, um, in, in the form of anything that Adonai, your God, has forbidden you. For Adonai, your God, is a consuming fire, a jealous God. He will not share you with other false gods that are man-made. And, uh, and many, many were worshiping, you know, 
metal metal images and you name it when your father i'm sorry when you father children and children's children and have been in the land a long time and you act corruptly and make a graven image in the form of anything and do evil in the sight of adonai your god provoking him to anger i call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will certainly be carried off quickly from the land you are crossing over the Jordan to possess. So this is a prophetic word, actually, that Moses is giving because we know that that happened. Uh, that happened to the northern kingdom. The kingdom actually got divided. There were 10 tribes that were in the northern kingdom known as Israel, with the capital of Samaria. They were carried off to, to Assyria. And the southern kingdom um, was the tribe of Judah. And it was the kingdom of Judah with the capital of Jerusalem. Um, and actually, Benjamin also joined Judah. So there was two tribes there. They were carried off to Babylon. So, um, so yes, this is very prophetic, but it did indeed happen. You will not prolong your days on it, for you will be certainly destroyed. Adonai will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where Adonai will drive you. There you will serve man-made gods of wood and stone, which do not see or hear or eat or smell. But from there you will seek Adonai your God, and you will find him when you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in distress... And all these things have come on you in the latter days, you will return to Adonai your God and listen to his voice. For Adonai your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. So those that are teaching replacement theology, this breaks that, that false doctrine right here. It, it, the covenant will never be forgotten because God will never abandon Israel. Indeed, ask now about the former days that were before you from the day that God created man on the earth and ask from one end of the sky to the other. He has, has there ever been such a great thing as this or has anything like it been heard? Has the people ever heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of the fire as you have heard and lived? Or has any God ever tried to come to take for himself a nation from within a nation by trials, by signs and wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and an outstretched arm, and by great terrors, like all that Ananiah your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes, you were shown, so that you might know that Adonai is God. There is no other besides him. From the heavens he has made you hear his voice to instruct you, and on earth he caused you to see his great fire. You heard his words. From the midst of the fire because he loved you because he loved your fathers he chose their descendants after them then he brought you out from egypt with his presence by his great power to drive out from before you nations greater and mightier than you to bring you in to give you their land for an inheritance as it is this day now i want to mention this too because we're coming up to the inheritance that was given to israel which is far greater then what you see Israel today, Israel's about the size of, of New Jersey. Oh no, it's far greater and larger than that, according to God, the creator. And everything belongs to God. So this is like so crazy how they want to argue and say that Israel is occupying. Israel is not occupying anything. That is the land that was given to them by God Almighty. So really, these people are fighting against God by doing this stuff and they won't have to answer to it believe you me god is going to make it known who is in control and who gave who to what and and actually everything belongs to god anyway so it doesn't belong to the people that claim it is i mean if everything went back to what god really gave israel there'd be a lot of unhappy middle easterners i'll tell you that because some of their land would be taken to be given back to what is rightfully actually Israel. They're not fighting about that. They're they're actually they're just trying to live peacefully in the land that they are living in right now. That is their land. So let that be known to those that are 
are saying Israel is occupying. They're, that, that belongs to them. It's the other way around. Sorry. That's, that's the way it is. If you, if you are a Bible believing, if you're a Bible believer and you believe in this Bible, then you need to know that that land all belongs to Israel plus more. And whose word are you going to believe, man or God's? I'd say I'd side with God 100% of the time. So you will know today and take to heart that Adonai, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth below. There is no other. You must keep his statutes and his mitzvah and mitzvah are commandments. Which I am commanding you today so that it may go well with you and with your children after you. And so that you may prolong your days in the land that Adonai, your God, is giving you for all time. Then Moses set apart three cities beyond the Jordan towards the east. There the manslayer might flee, who kills his neighbor unintentionally and did not hate him previously. That would have been like an accident. He may flee to one of these cities and live. Bazer in the wilderness and the plateau, for the Reubenites, Ramat in the Gilead, for the Gadites, and Golan in the Bashan, for the Manasites. The Golan, which exists today, as we know. This is the Torah which Moses set before Benaiah Israel. These are the testimonies and the statutes and the ordinances which Moses spoke to Benaiah Israel when they came out from Egypt beyond the Jordan in the valley opposite Beth Peor, in the land of Sihon, king of the Amorites who lived at Heshbon, whom Moses and Benaiah Israel struck down when they came out from Egypt. They took possession of his land and the land of Og, king of the Bashan, the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan towards the east from Aror, which is on the edge of the Wadi Arnon, as far as Mount Sion, that is Hermon, and all the Araba beyond the Jordan eastward as far as the Sea of the Araba under the slopes of Pisgah. So that's a lot there. Um, and so they had been given land east of the Jordan and of course the, the promised land of Canaan, which was across the Jordan. The Ten Words or Ten Commandments, this is going to be reviewed again and this is chapter 5. Moses called out to all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the ordinances that I am speaking in your hearing today. Learn them and make sure to do them. Adonai, our God, cut a covenant with us in Horeb. Not with our fathers has Adonai cut this covenant, but with us, all of us alive here today. Adonai spoke with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire. I was standing between Adonai and you at that, that time to tell you the word of Adonai because you were afraid because of the fire and did not go up the mountain. He said, I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. You shall not have other gods beside me. Do not make for yourself a graven image, no image of what is in the heavens above or on the earth, beneath or in the water under the earth. Do not bow down to them or worship them. For I, Adonai, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my mitzvah. You must not take the name of Adonai, your God, in vain, for Adonai will not leave unpunished anyone who takes his name in vain. Observe Yom Shabbat to keep it holy. As Adonai, your God, commanded you six days, you are to labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Shabbat to Adonai, your God. In it, you are not to do any work, not you or your son or your daughter or your slave or your maid or your ox, your donkey or any of your livestock or the outsider within your gates so that your slave and your maid may rest as you do. You must remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and Adonai, your God, brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, Adonai, your God, commanded you to keep Yom Shabbat. Honor your father and mother, just as Adonai, your God, commanded you, so that your days may be long and it may go well with you in the land Adonai, your God, is giving you. 
Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor. How much slander and 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 false act, false statements are made about people in, in in the days that we live in? Look at politics. They 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 slander each other all the all the time. That's what just I'm not political. I'm biblical, so uh, can't stand it. It's it's ridiculous. Uh, but that's a lot of bearing false witness. So they're going to have to answer to God. Um, with all this corruption. Do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor desire your neighbor's house, his field, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. These words, and then I spoke to all your assembly on the mountain from the midst of the fire, the cloud and the fog, with a great voice, he added no more. He wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. I just want to mention, do not murder. There are actually religions out there that think they're going to heaven for murdering people in the name of God. God does not, God, God is almighty. He doesn't need people to, to do these things on, on his behalf. Uh, all he has to do, all he had to do was speak this world into existence. There is no, none other than our God, period. So no, he doesn't need humanity to to hurt humanity he loves humanity he created all mankind in his image so no that is absolutely wrong and besides that our if if you go to the new testament our apostles told us and that was in the first century a.d it, things were completed everything was finished jesus said when he died on the cross it is finished and they went on to teach the gospel of Yeshua, of Jesus Christ, uh, also teaching on the Old Testament, because actually there was no New Testament when, when the apostles were out there teaching. Everything was based on the Old Testament. So for those that are teaching New Testament only, you are missing a big chunk and not really getting a clear understanding of the big picture. You need, you need the old to understand the new. Um, and also, also, it was stated to us, if anyone comes to you with an other gospel other than what we are bringing to you, it is from the devil himself. So, no, any religions that came after that and are twisting the word of God and counterfeiting the word of God is not from God. So just to know what really was stated, look at your Bible, read your Bible. That is the true word of God. It has stood the test of time. Why do you think it's such a contested book? Because the devil hates it. Anything that comes under attack so vehemently, you need to question what's going on here. You know, it's the devil attacking. The devil hates God. The devil hates humanity. So just, I just wanted to bring that to light here. Live and prolong your days. As soon as you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was blazing with fire, you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders. Then you said, Adonai, our God, has just shown us his glory and his greatness. And we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. This day we have seen that God speaks with man. And yet he, keep, he keeps on living. Now then, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. They were afraid because of, you know, seeing the glory of God. I mean, they've heard God and they didn't, they didn't see God himself, but they saw the glory. They saw, they saw the, the blaze of fire on the mountain, the smoke. The mountain was shaking and quaking. They heard this big trumpet noises. Um, and they were they were greatly afraid. They didn't know what to expect. So unfortunately, the people could have had a relationship reestablished with God that was lost through Adam and Eve, and they forfeited it. They, as you're going to see here, and, and we talked about this earlier, if we hear the voice of Adonai, our God, any more, then we will die. For who is there of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the midst of the fire as we have and lived? 
Now they're saying this to, to Moses. You go near and hear all that Adonai our God says. Then you tell us all what Adonai our God tells you, and we will hear it and do it. Adonai heard the tone of your words when you spoke to me, and Adonai said to me, I've heard the tone of the words that this people have spoken to you. They've done well in all they've spoken. If only there was such a heart in them to fear me and keep all my mitzvah always so that it might go well with them and with their children forever. So what they got was they got the Torah instead of a relationship. Moses had the relationship. So, you know, they they basically said, you know, you, you go, Moses, and uh, we'll do whatever he tells us to do. And that's where they got the Torah. Go say to them, return to your tents. But as for you, stand here by me, and I will tell you the whole commandment both the statutes and the ordinances that you are to teach them, and they will do them in the land I am giving them to possess. So you must take care to do as Adonai your God has commanded you, and do not turn aside to the right or to the left. You are to walk in all the way that Adonai your God has commanded you, so that you may live and it may be well with you, and you may prolong your days in the land that you will possess. And as we know, as a spoiler alert, they went astray. They they started mixing and mingling with the world and the ways of the world, and it pulled them in the wrong direction. Chapter 6. Now, this is the commandment that the statutes and ordinances that Ananiah your God commanded to teach you to do in the land you are crossing over to possess, so that you might fear Ananiah your God to keep all his statutes and mitzvah that I am commanding you and your son and your son's sons all the days of your life, so that you may prolong your days. Hear therefore, O Israel, and take care to do this, so that it may go well with you, and you may increase mightily, as Adonai, the God of our fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Here's where um, the Shema comes into the greatest commandment of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love Adonai your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These words, which I am commanding you today, are to be on your heart. You are to teach them diligently to your children and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on your hand. They are to be as frontlets between your eyes. And write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. When you prosper, do not forget. Now, when Adonai, your God, brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns dug that you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, and you eat and are full, then watch yourself so that you do not forget Adonai, who brought you out from the land of Egypt, from the house of slavery. You must fear Adonai your God and serve him and swear by his name. You must not go after other gods. And here we go again. That's repeated again. The gods of the peoples around you for Adonai your God in the midst of you is a jealous God. Otherwise, the anger of Adonai your God will be kindled against you and he will wipe you from the face of the earth. You are not to test Adonai your God as you tested him at Massa. Diligently keep the mitzvah of Adonai your God and his testimonies and his statutes that he has commanded you. You are to do what is right and good in the sight of Adonai so that it may go well with you and you may go in and possess the good land that Adonai swore to your fathers to drive out all your enemies from before you as Adonai had spoken. When your son asks you in time to come saying, what are the testimonies and the statutes and the ordinances that Adonai our God commanded you? Then you are to tell your son, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and Adonai brought us out from Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, Adonai showed signs and wonders great and terrible on Egypt, on Pharaoh, and on all his house. Then he brought out, then he brought us out from there so that he might bring us in to give us the land that he swore to our fathers. Adonai commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear Adonai our God for our, our good, for our good always, to keep us alive, as is the case this day. It will be righteousness to us if we take care to do all 
this commandment before Adonai our God, just as he has commanded us. Chapter 7, now we're just going to actually do part of chapter 7. We will pick up the other part of chapter 7 next week. We're only going to go to the, to, to, to the 11th verse, including the 11th verse, I should say. No mixing with idol leaders. Now, this is so important because this brings us to also the idol worship and worshiping other gods issue again. When Adonai, your God, brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out many nations before you, the Hittite and the Girgashite and the Amorite, the Canaanite and the Perizzite, the Hivite and the Jebusite, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you, and Adonai, your God, gives them over to you and you strike them down and you are to utterly destroy them. You are to make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. Now, there were giants in the land, too. Understand that. They were corrupt. They, were, they, they, they would later become a thorn to Israel. And this is what God was, was telling them um, to utterly destroy them completely. Uh, otherwise, they're going to have issues. And so they did it. They didn't completely destroy them. You are not to intermarry with them. You are not to give your daughter to his son or take his daughter for your son. For he will turn your son away from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of Adonai will be kindled against you, and he will swiftly destroy you. Instead, you are to deal with them like this. Tear down their altars, smash their pillars, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their carved images with fire. For you are a holy people to Adonai your God from all the peoples on the face of the earth. Adonai, your God, has chosen you to be his treasured people. It is not because you are more numerous than all the peoples that Adonai set, set his love on you and chose you, for you are the least of all peoples. Rather, because of his love for you and is keeping the oath he swore to your fathers, Adonai brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that Adonai your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant with kindness for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his mitzvah, but repays those who hate him to their face to annihilate them. He will not hesitate with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore you are to keep the commandment, both the statutes and the ordinances that I am commanding you today to do them. Now, next week, we're going to pick that up with Parashat Ikev. So we're going to recap here on the Torah portion before we go on to the half Torah portion. So last week's Torah portion was Devarim, and, and the Israelites stood poised at the edge of the Promised Land on the east side of the Jordan, ready to cross over and possess the land. Before they crossed, Moses summarized for the people their 40-year history of wandering in the wilderness. This week... Moses pled to Adonai uh, to change his mind about him crossing over, and God told him he will not, and he didn't want to hear any more about it, that he would be dying on the, the, that side of the Jordan. So also Moses went on to remind the people of things that have, had happened, also reminding them of the Ten Commandments, the Shema, um, and so so several of the best known and fundamental passages of scripture occurred in this week's uh, Torah portion, specifically the Shema, the Lord's greatest commandment. So um, this is the first prayer spoken in the morning and the last said in the evening before sleep. It is often the final prayer on the lips of, of, of a Jewish person on their deathbed has been uttered by many martyrs as they gave up their spirits to the Lord. Um, these verses of scriptures are so central to Judaism also that they are written on a parchment and placed in a small box worn on the forehead called tefillin or phylacteries and also in small decorated boxes called mezuzot and these are in the doorposts of Jewish homes. Yes, um, and, and they are little, little little parchments inside of there um, when you purchase them. Um, which it is 
tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. This is significant of, of that. Um, so this week's Torah portion begins with Moses, again, reminding the people how he pleaded with Adonai for the privilege of entering the promised land, but how God refused to grant his request. So Moses would not enter the promised land because he disobediently struck the rock twice in the wilderness of Zin instead of speaking to it as God had commanded. God wanted to show his glory in a different way, and he actually did not, because of that, he, was, he did not do that. Uh, this happened when the nation's water well dried up after his sister Miriam died. Moses and Aaron prayed about the situation, and God told Moses to give the people water by speaking to the rock. But Moses was angry with the people for their whining and called the people rebels and implied that it was he and Aaron who were providing for them. Some have suggested that speaking to the rock might have symbolized God's word as given to Moses, and striking the rock may have represented Moses' effort, which is definitely true. So God did not, you know, God wanted to show his glory to the people and not have it felt that Moses was doing this. Though Moses and Aaron were called to lead the Israelites, performing many signs and wonders, it was God who was providing for them miraculously, supplying life-giving water when necessary. As a result, God told Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land that I give them. So Moses, some, some rabbinic tradition says that Moses actually begged God 515 times. Um, so uh, taken from the gematria, a numerical value of the word va'akanan, uh, Moses tells the people how he asked God, let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, that fine hill country and, and the Lebanon. But because of you, the Lord was angry with me and would not listen to me. And, and actually heard, we heard Moses say that to the people. That is enough, Adonai said. And he said, do not speak to me anymore about this matter. So God said no. Although Moses would get a glimpse of the land of promise, he would, he would be among those of his generation who would die in the wilderness because of their sins. His successor, Joshua, would cross over the Jordan with the new generation of Israelites who would conquer the land. Only Joshua and Caleb from the first generation were going over. Joshua, whose Hebrew name is Yahashua, uh, the Lord is salvation, it means, takes the people into the promised land where they will take hold of all that God promised. He is a type of Messiah. Yeshua, which is a form of the name of Yahashua, will one day take his people into the true promised land of heaven where we will not perish, but inherit eternal life. We can learn a lesson from Moses remaining on the other side of the Jordan. There are times when despite our earnest begging and pleading God in his perfect wisdom, justice and mercy simply says no, and that is the end of the matter. God may even ask us to encourage someone in the next generation who will carry the torch further than we have, and we need to accept this decision with a grace born of humility. God has a plan. And he knows what it is, what he wants each of us to do. And, and we will all pass a mantle over to the next generation to carry on. Before Moses surrenders the leadership of Israel to Joshua, he exhorts the people to keep God's Torah and to live in obedience in God's way so that they may take possession of the land and be able to remain in there. Moses reminded the children of Israel how they stood at the foot of Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments. He warned them not to forget the Torah of God and to diligently teach God's commandments to their children and grandchildren. In telling them this, he reminds them three times that God spoke from the fire at Sinai in which he did not have a form. Therefore, because they saw no image of God, they are not to carve for themselves images of God, which is detrimental to faith, nor of other gods, which is idolatry. So the prohibition of making a carved image is accompanied by the warning that God is a consuming fire. The name of God used in this verse is Elkanah, the jealous God, and that's spelled E-L, and the second word is K-A-N-A-H, known as jealous God. This name is also mentioned elsewhere in this parasha. So um, the names and titles of God declared 
to the world who he is. They also answer our deepest questions regarding our relationship to God. The name Elkina reveals that God is protective of his people and his relationship with them. In the same way that the relationship between a husband and a wife is sacred, he will not share our praise and devotion with other gods. In fact, the covenant God made with Israel at Mount Sinai is likened to a marriage ceremony complete with a cloud covering, symbolizing the kupa, the marriage canopy, and the ketchuba, the marriage contract, outlining the responsibilities and privileges of both bride and bridegroom, and the agreed upon vows. God is therefore asking his people to be faithful unto him, forsaking all other gods. All forms of idolatry and worship of false gods is spiritual adultery and can be likened to an unfaithful spouse. And actually, later when Israel does sin, you know, and, and God is addressing Israel, he actually does state it in that manner through the prophets. The Lord lovingly and faithfully watches over his bride and jealously guards her like a passionate husband protects, protecting his bride. Adonai will get, and actually the unfaithfulness in exile is prophesied also by, by Moses. Um, the tragic consequences of Israel straying from their devotion to God and turning to idols that would send them into exile, which is Galut, and that's G-A-L-U-T, and scattered to the four corners of the earth. This is exactly what happened when the Babylonians and the Romans destroyed the Holy Temple and Jerusalem. Well, also when the Assyrians also carried off the, the ten tribes. However, God is merciful. He promised that if the people would repent and turn back to him with all of their heart and soul, then he would relent and bring them back to the land, which indeed he did. Indeed, in fulfillment of a great number of prophecies, including those of Moses, the Lord did bring his people home from Babylon. And in these last days, he is once again bringing his people home. This miracle has happened in our very generation as many of our people are returning to the land of our forefathers from the north, south, east, and west. It is not because of our righteousness that we have come back to the land, but because of the covenant God made with our ancestors. So no one can say otherwise. God made an unbreakable covenant with our ancestors and God does not break covenants and 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 people should be glad that God does not break covenants because if he breaks covenants and promises he could break them with everybody um and he does not he is not human that's something human beings do they break vows promises covenants uh, but God does not he is the same yesterday today and forever now, God said no to Moses here, and we saw that, but uh, we can uh, also see that he had said no to King David also um, when King David's infant son from the adulterous affair with Bathsheba uh, be be it actually became gravely ill. David begged God to spare the child's life. He fasted and prayed, prostrated himself. Face to the ground all night, nevertheless, the child died because actually through Nathan the prophet, he was told that he would not live. So how did David react to God's decision then? When David learned that the child was dead, he picked himself up, washed and anointed himself, changed his clothes and went into the house of the Lord and worship. Then he went home and ate something. What a picture of submission to the will of God. David realized that God, in his wisdom, had made his judgment. And he accepted it, recognizing God's divine rule and sovereignty. And also, Moses also accepted that he, you know, eventually that he was not going to go into the promised land. We also see in the Brit Kadashah an example of perfect submission in Yeshua HaMashiach. Um, even he was met with the answer no from his beloved father in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeshua asked if the cup of suffering could be taken from him. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And although Yeshua was sorrowful, deeply distressed, to realize the terrible suffering he'd endure, even death on a cross, he submitted to the will of God, saying, 
Oh, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. And he was, he was obedient even to death. Now, a little extra nugget here in Hebrew, the Garden of Gethsemane is called Gat Shemanim, and that means oil press Shemanim, and that's S-H-E-M-A-N-I-M, is the plural form of Sheman, and that's S-H-E-M-E-N, the Hebrew word for oil. Since oil represents the anointing of Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, it was an appropriate place for Yeshua to submit to the will of, of Abba, Father, uh, and receiving an anointing to carry it out. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And that's Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. What can we learn from Moses, David, and Yeshua? We learn that there will be times when God's resounding no may cause us pain and sorrow. And we can also learn that God says no for a variety of reasons. For instance, in the case of Moses and David, the consequences of sin was involved. In the case of Yeshua in the Garden of Gethsemane, there was but one way for the will of God, mankind's redemption from sin, to be accomplished, and that was through him. From these examples, we can also see that if we graciously accept and trust God's answer of no, our trials may refine our character and make us more like Yeshua. May we all be wise enough to recognize when God is saying no. He, he knows the big picture as well. And and he has our best will and plan for our lives as well. So we need to definitely trust in him. A little bit about the Shema. The Shema is an affirmation of basic tenets of Jewish faith. It also is a declaration of faith in one God for a nation surrounded by a sea of pagans worshiping a variety of false gods. The verses that follow the initial words of the Shema, listen, hear, do, uh, is commonly called the Ahavata. And you shall love. And that's V apostrophe A H A V T A. It expresses Israel's duty to love God with all their heart, soul, and might. And that is what we are to do. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all, all your soul and with all your strength. The Shema reflects the first instance in human history that the love of God was demanded in any religion. In fact, the love of God is the distinctive mark of a true worshiper. What is love of God? The first letter of John provides a wonderfully succinct answer, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, and that's in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. The Va'ahavata also reveals that loving God involves what we say. We are to teach his commandments to our children and speak about the word of God all day long. Um, we are even to go so far as binding God's word as the sign on our hand and between our eyes. In other words, loving God involves not only what we say and teach, but what we, what we think and do. The love of God involves where we go and how we live. For that reason, the word of God is also to be written on the doorposts of our house and on our gates. So... Also, I, I think I've taught this before. Um, this is a very interesting little tidbit of history here. Um, uh, Jewish children are taught the Shema. Uh, this is one of the first things that is learned. Um, the mothers will pray it over them morning and night as well. So they learn that a lot from the mothers. Um, and during world, after World War II, there was a rabbi, actually Rabbi Herzog, uh, was looking for the missing Jewish children that had been displaced you know, during the Holocaust. And he went to uh, a particular orphanage that was run by Catholics. And they told him that, oh, there's none of your children here. And he said, let me try something. And he proceeded to recite the Shema and all these little children called out for their mothers and were crying. So that's how he identified they were Jewish children. Um, so that's that's very interesting because, yeah, that's one of the first things that is taught in the home is the Shema. We're going to go into the half Torah portion, and this week we are reading also from uh, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 to 31. Comfort, proclaim good news. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. 
speak kindly to the heart of Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, for she has received from Adonai's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of Adonai, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley will be lifted up, every mountain and hill made low. Now this is the, the prophecy of Yeshua right here. Uh, prepare the way of Adonai from that point on. The, the rough ground will be a plain and the rugged terrain smooth. The glory of Adonai will be revealed and all flesh will see it together for the mouth of Adonai has spoken. A voice is saying, cry out. So I said, what shall I cry out? All flesh is grass and all its loveliness is light. The flower of the field, the grass withers, the flower fades for the breath of Adonai blows on it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Get yourself up on a high mountain, you who are you who bring good news to Zion. Lift up your voice with strength, you who bring good news to Jerusalem. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Look, Adonai Elohim comes with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he tends his flock. He gathers the lambs in his arms, carries them in his bosom, and gently guides nursing ewes. Now, that is definitely Yeshua. Who is like him? Who has measured the waters in the palm of his hand or measured out heaven with a span or calculated the dust of the earth in a measure or weighed the mountain in scales or the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the Ruach Adonai or instruct him as his counselor? With whom did he consult and with and who instructed him? Who taught him in the path of justice or taught him knowledge? Who informed him about the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and count as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, the islands weigh as fine dust. Lebanon is not enough to burn, or its animals enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. By him, they are accounted null and void. To whom? Then will you liken God? To what likeness will you compare him? To an idol? A craftsman casts it. A goldsmith overlays it with golden fashion, silver chains for it. One too poor for such an offering chooses wood that will, will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to prepare him an idol that will not totter. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth he sits above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the skies like a curtain, spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He reduces princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth a confusion. Scarcely are they planted. Scarcely are they sown. Scarcely the, their stem takes root in the earth where he blows on them and they wither. And a storm carries them off as stubble. To whom then will you liken me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? The one who brings out their host by number, the one who calls them all by name because of his great strength and vast power. Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from Adonai and the justice do me escapes the notice of my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? Adonai is the eternal God, the creator of the ends of the earth, who does not grow tired or weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives strength to the weary, and to, to one without vigor he adds might. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But they who wait for Adonai will renew their strength. They will soar up with wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk. And not be faint. And that is the end of our half Torah portion. And we're going to close, we're going to actually do a quick recap of both. Of course, a parashat Va'ekanan um, is Ask for mercy and I besought. Moses tells the people of Israel how he implored God to allow him to enter the land of Israel, but God refused, instructing him instead to ascend a mountain and see the promised land. 
Continuing his review of the Torah, Moses described the exodus from Egypt and the giving of the Torah, declaring them unprecedented events in human history. Has there ever occurred this great thing, or has the like of it ever been heard? Did ever a people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire and live? You were shown to know that the Lord is God. There is none else beside him. Moses predicts that in the future generations, the people will turn away from God, worship idols, and be exiled from their land and scattered amongst the nations. But from there, they will seek God and return to obey his commandments. This parashat also includes the repetition of the Ten Commandments and the verses of the Shema, which declare the fundamentals of our faith, the unity of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The mitzvah to love God, to study his Torah, and to bind these words as tefillin on our arms and heads and inscribe them in the mezuzot affixed on the doorposts of our homes. The half Torah portion we just read, this week's half half Torah, is the first of a series of seven half half Torah of consolation. These seven half Torah commence on the Shabbat following Tisha B'Av, which this is, the first Shabbat after Tisha B'Av, and continue until Rosh Hashanah. This section of Isaiah begins with God's exhortation to the prophets, comfort, O comfort my people. Announce to Jerusalem that her period of exile has been fulfilled and that her sins have been forgiven. Isaiah's prophecy describes some of the miraculous events that will unfold with the onset of the Messianic era such as the return of the exiles to Jerusalem, the revelation of God's glory, and the rewards and retribution that will then be meted out. The prophet also goes on to comfort the people, describing God's power and might and reassuring them of his care for his people. He also, the first coming of Yeshua was described too, and actually Elijah states this in the New, New Testament in the Brit Kadeshah, prepare the way of the Lord. He, he was preparing the way Um, for the introduction of Yeshua. So that is the end of our Torah and half Torah portion. We are going to close in prayer this segment, and then we'll take a break and we'll come back with the second part of Shabbat service. Father God, we just want to thank you for this powerful word. We want to thank you that you are steadfast, and we can certainly count on your word, and you don't stray from your word. And when you make a commitment and you make a covenant you you stick to that covenant it's the people it, it's people that stray from the covenant and break the covenant you never do we can certainly count on your word and your word is steadfast and true and holy just as you are father god and we thank you for for being steadfast we thank you for who you are there is no one like you Father God, we give you all our praise and all honor and glory go to you. And we pray this prayer in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Take a short break and we will come back with part two. <laughs> 